understanding. Used 160 times in 156 verses of the Bible. The intelligence and insight of both God and men. He is either Lord or lunatic and nothing in between. Who is Jesus Christ? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television and Quick Study Radio. Thank you for joining us by radio or television. And today we focus on the book of Hebrews, written to the Hebrews, chapters 1 through 5. And we're asking the question because the book of Hebrews begins to talk about the work of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ, really? Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, I saw the movie, Mel Gibson's movie, so I know who he is. Mm -hmm. But that's one scene, uh, albeit a very important scene, out of the life of Christ. We're going to talk about that and more in the work of Jesus in a moment. Corey is here with Bible, Archaeology, and History. Corey? Today, we are going to talk about how accurate is the history that the theology of the book of Hebrews is built around. That's an interesting subject. How accurate is it? All right, we might get into some textual criticism. Who knows? Uh, do you know? Yes, Hebrews chapters 1 through 5. So, do you know that the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110, verse 4, in saying about Jesus, You are a priest forever, according to the order of who? So, we're looking for a name there. Okay, very good. All right, that and more coming up. As Quick Study continues, stay with us. Now, Corey is here. Let's take a look at Bible archaeology and history. of Hebrews, as you'll notice as you read through this book, relies heavily on Old Testament writings, and he takes them as historically accurate. Now, right now, you and I are going to take a look at the patriarchs, that is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founding fathers of Israel, and we're going to talk about their historic accuracy. A biblical look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the only fair approach to the study of the patriarchs because they are historical figures introduced through the Bible. It's surprisingly easy to forget this simple truth in today's information is everywhere society. Beginning with the Bible, we see right away an interesting picture of nomadic and semi-nomadic men, meaning that they were travelers with livestock and tents. And yet, they were successful enough in the economies of the lands they traveled in to have direct influence in the pagan governments, the power to buy land, and even in the case of Isaac, the ability to buy and cultivate farmland. With their direct interactions with pagan kings, their numerous slaves, the surprising military branches of their tribes that Abraham himself led, and the biblical references of them owning camels? And a picture begins to emerge of intriguingly economic powerhouses driven by theological conviction. The biblical patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob seem to fit neatly into a category of the ancient economy from the second millennia BC and before. It's recently been pieced together by historians and is known from old Assyrian and Babylonian texts, these family groups referred to as traveling merchants. 
Like the patriarchs, they were nomadic and semi-nomadic. They dealt in livestock, bought and sold land, wrote and entered agreements with settled kings, were military leaders, were a huge part of the ancient slave market, and a sign of the most wealthy was ownership of camels. The Bible has continued to gain respect as an historically accurate book of theology, despite claims against it. The case of the Bible's wealthy, influential patriarchs, now known as part of the historically established traveling merchants, is just one example. It is time to explore the wise guys of the Bible. They're all around us. We are looking at Hebrews 1 through 5. That's our reading assignment today. And the book of Hebrews seems to be written to the Jews who had recognized Jesus as Messiah in the first century. Now, wise guys know that for a devout Jew to do so means excommunication from family and from friends, loss of status, loss of friends, possibly loss of a job and a way of life or a way of making money to survive. Now, with all this and more risk, it was important for those claiming Jesus as Messiah to be sure who he really was and what he really did. So the writer of Hebrews eloquently expresses this by quoting the Old Testament or the Tanakh at least seven times in the first 13 verses of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1 quotes Psalms six times, Deuteronomy once, and 2 Samuel once. Let's explore. Hebrews 1, 1 through 14. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed." But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. You're watching Quick Study, listening to Quick Study Radio. It is great to have you with us. Have we got a treat today? We are studying Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. What an amazing uh, book it is of the 13 chapters. And today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 1. And I, I call this Who is Jesus? Now, the book of Hebrews obviously is written to the Hebrews, those beautiful Jewish people in the church who have accepted Messiah. When they accepted Messiah, it cost them a great deal. Oftentimes, it costs their family. Uh, their family would reject them. Actually, some families have a funeral service for them. 
And so it was a great cost. Now, they were convinced by the power of the Holy Spirit to do so, but second guessing comes when pain comes. Beloved, how many times have you and I made a decision and we were convinced at the moment, you know, that was the right thing to do, and then pain comes along and we're like, oh, should we have really done that? Why do we second guess ourselves? Because the pain has a way of doing that. One of the reasons the book of Hebrews is written is to understand who Messiah really was. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, the first several verses here. We're going to read 14 verses and discover the nature of who Jesus was from this and the wisdom it brings us. God, who at various times, Hebrews 1 verse 1, and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he had appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin. Notice that line. There was no religious offering. There was no Mosaic law that did it. But he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inductance, or rather inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, this is a fascinating passage. This is the DNA of who Jesus is. And so with that, the first wisdom point is obvious. Jesus is not simply some kind of mystical angel or some kind of mystical prophet. Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe Yeshua HaMashiach is Messiah. He is Lord. And that's what he is saying here. The writing of Hebrews, which, by the way, I happen to believe is the, the Apostle Paul, the former Pharisee. But the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is Lord. He did it all. Now look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. It says, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now this is the second advent of Christ. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, to God, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. He's describing this to Jesus. Let's carry on with verse 10. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, that is the heavens, like a cloak, which you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your, tear, your years rather, will not fail. Beloved, let me just make this point very clear. Jesus Christ is the substance of God. He is God. And so Jesus is and always has been the creator of your soul and the attended keeper of your soul and your spirit. So let Jesus be that in your life. You say, Rod, well, I'm trying to. And yet, isn't it interesting that every time someone publishes another book on what an angel said, we run off to the Christian bookstore and start buying them? What about God's word? What about God's book? You see, beloved, Paul said, if I or an angel tell you any other gospel, let him be accursed. The word is anathema. We are mesmerized by the mystical, but Jesus is so far beyond it. He is the substance of reality. He is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. He is the supreme reality of everything. So far above the angels. Well, why would you go to an angel when you can go to the creator of the universe and the creator of that angel? Now, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? What a line! Do you realize what has happened here? Because Jesus Christ is Lord, and if we invite him as Lord in our life, we give him authority in our life, 
then what he does as we trickle through life and in this journey, sojourning just for a time, because his kingdom is not here, his kingdom is yet to come, and we are simply visitors in this world, that the Bible says the angels actually minister and help us walk that walk. Not by conferring with us the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does that directly, but by making sure the path is straight. And so, beloved, I encourage you today, do not address your prayers to angels. Do not address your prayers to uh, ministering spirits. Address your prayers exclusively to Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Address your prayers exclusively. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. means this, Jesus can and will be your only strength and ability to overcome evil and Satan in your life and in this world. We do not seek help and deliverance from angels. We seek help and deliverance from Jesus. What does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 28? He says to his disciples, all authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. And so I warn you in the name of Jesus Christ, the conversations we must have must be directly through the Holy Spirit. Uh, John chapter 14 says, I send you a comforter, and his name is the Holy Spirit, and he will teach you all things. Focus your efforts and your prayers upon the Lord your God. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says Jesus. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Right for yours today, the address is coming up later. You and I are going to continue to talk about the historic accuracy of the Old Testament when it is talking specifically about the founding fathers of Israel, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, there is a very small detail within the histories recorded in the Old Testament about these men that has turned out to really open the door to their accuracy. Details often hold the key to understanding historical narrative. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are clearly portrayed through their details in the Bible as wealthy men, semi nomadic merchants traveling between Mesopotamia and Canaan. For many years, doubt was the forefront of thought when it came to the accuracy of the Genesis patriarchs. In recent years, however, the lifestyles of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have been revealed as a normal, vital part of ancient economy, the Bible's portrayal finally being vindicated as accurate. Yet, there's still one detail frequently dismissed as anachronistic, false, out of order, a mistake. This so-called mistake? Camels. In Genesis 12, 30 and 32, references are made to domesticated camels. In chapter 32, Jacob is even seen to be breeding them. And in Genesis 24, they're used to travel caravan style back to Haran, carrying presents and displaying the wealth of the family to a possible new daughter-in-law. Those who claim a problem point to the fact that there was no proof of camel domestication until generations after Abraham, from 1st millennia BC Assyrian reliefs of pack and war camels. Until recently, there hasn't been much to say on this issue, but lack of evidence does not mean proof of a point. It just means more research is necessary. A cord of braided camel's hair from very ancient Egypt and a reference to camel's milk from Sumerian texts still weren't enough to change minds. But now, intrigue has been raised again. Petroglyphs of a camel caravan dating to at least 1500 BC have been examined, as well as old Babylonian texts referencing domesticated camels. Sometimes it takes a while for established ideas to be turned around. But this is exactly what's happening with Abraham's camels. Beginning January 2014, Quick Study TV and the ministry team launch a special effort to search out God's wonderful word for daily strength in our lives. God promises to bring us divine wisdom, divine strength for our emotions, our financial needs, our family needs, and our workplace challenges. Join us in 2014 
to search the Bible specifically for God's strength in our day-to-day -day lives. Now make sure you're on our ready list to receive your January 2014 Bible Guide. In January, we begin a search. Let's find God's strength to keep us strong in today's world. To join us, send an offering in any amount to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In the United States, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. You can call us in Canada at 519-940-8338. Or in the United States at 724-733-8336. You know, Janice, the 13 chapters of Hebrews is really interesting because there are mysteries that are introduced in Hebrews. One of the things Hebrews says is that the known world, the, the, the world, the, this material world mm -hmm. right here, mm -hmm. comes from the unseen world. And in science, of course, we've figured that out because uh, the substance of all things are made up of atoms too small to see. Right. In fact, we have to use an electron microscope to bounce it off of these things because electrons are the smallest, well, not the smallest, but the easiest to control that small to bounce it off to draw a picture of a molecule. And so here Hebrews is right once again. There is another mystery, a kind of mystery man. Uh, so go ahead with this question. All right. So from Hebrews chapters 1 through 5, do you know that the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 verse 4 in saying this, about Jesus. You are a priest forever according to the order of who? Who, Corey? Um, that would be Melchizedek, who was a priest king that Abraham dealt with. I think it's somewhere around Genesis 17. All right. Well, uh, Melchizedek is absolutely the right answer. We read about that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, and we see it in Psalm 110, verse 4, where it says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, for those of you who were not paying attention to the teaching, <laughs> that's Melchizedek. Uh, for those of you who were paying attention to the teaching, of course, we just spent six minutes talking that's about right. him. But, uh, Corey, do you know what Jew ancient Jewish tradition thought who ancient Jewish tradition thought or presented Melchizedek as? Yeah, um, I believe that, that answer is Shem, and what's one of the sons of Noah, which is very interesting because if you work the numbers, it, it could work. It's, it's interesting. The, uh, and and it's really, it is really interesting, and uh, the, the name means uh, priest king of peace, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, uh, the, what, what, what city is Salam? Um, Jerusalem. It was, it was the city, the precursor city to Jerusalem. That's what Jerusalem turned into. And, and Salem is, is still preserved, or Salam is still preserved in the name Jerusalem. So. Which means uh, basically uh, the Judean city of peace. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because it is Jerusalem uh, that Zechariah 14 says will be the stumbling block of the nations. And that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. It's the only city in the world divided up into four quarters. It's the only city that has so many walls uh, carving it up. It is the most valuable real estate in the world, yet the only reason it's valuable is because the four religions are sharing it. And so this is a very interesting time. Now, the Bible says that there's going to be some serious events happening in the future in Jerusalem. That is where Jesus Christ is going to return. The Bible also says there will be a new Jerusalem, and a, which will come from heaven. Uh, not the existing one, but will come from heaven down into earth. And the Bible says actually there will be a new heaven and a new earth in the future after the 1,000 year reign. Very interesting. Now, I wanted to mention to you that we are beginning again next year to go through the Bible with our guides for strength, or our guides, our power guides, I'm calling them. That is strength to live from God's word daily. So all the new material, the 12,000 words every month written, everything is designed to gather the strength from God's Word. So could you use a little strength today? I could I use a little sure strength. I sure could. Uh, gather a little strength from God's Word every single day. 
And so my, the, the big master plan is that we had the, the wisdom, mm -hmm. and now we're going to have strength, and then we're going to work towards discernment in 2015. But that's another story for another day. Here's the address. If you're not on the mailing list, you won't receive it. And this is our year end coming up in just a couple of days here. So if you want a tax receipt, get it in now. It is P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150 in Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. We'll be looking for your letter today. Absolute humanity of Jesus Christ has been emphasized throughout the modern pulpit methodology of the neo churches. But biblical theology also tells us Jesus is fully Lord. God's wisdom is at work in us when we build our understanding of Jesus Christ with the whole counsel of God. Jesus Christ did not only die on the cross, but he rose again. And his miracle of life was not simply to resurrect himself but also to heal those who choose to make him Lord and heal from eternal death. So with that we pray, Lord, help me to teach who you really are from the whole counsel of God, not just the parts I like. In our Wise Up segment today, we are coming upon the last part of Proverbs. Today, our reading is Proverbs chapter 26, verses 13 to 22. Now, here is a line or a verse lifted from that scripture. It says this, He who passes by and meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a dog by the ears. Is that not clear enough? Well, let me make it clearer for you. If somebody else has difficulty, they don't need your comment on it. If somebody else, if, if you see something going on that there's a lot of buzz around, probably better just to leave it alone. Let me tell you something. We need to mind our own business. And our own business is, are we right with God? Well, the only way to get right with God is to allow Jesus Christ to come into your life and to be Lord of your life. And so I wish to encourage you today to do that. Allow Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You say, well, how do I do that? What do you mean allow? Well, he will not come into your heart unless you ask him. You ask and you say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again to take my sin away. And I decide today to make you Lord of my life. It's called the sinner's prayer. It's a great prayer. Pray it many times. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television Program. Remember our address in the United States is P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2.